Welcome to this first of a series of stories about the life and ministry influence of Dr. T.L. Osborne. 2023 is the year that we're celebrating his 100 years of life influence. We're taking advantage of this year to do something we've never done before, and I want you to be in on it. The first of each month, we are going to post a specific story about his life. And what I'm looking for are those significant events throughout his life that I consider pillars, things that were significant in his life in the ministry that we all enjoy. Not only that, but I'm looking for those principles that we can learn from. How do we discover how to serve God in a way that lasts beyond our lifetime? This, is, I think, should be the goal of every believer. So let's just start with this first Friday in January 2023. And I want to start with the story of my father's early life. You may have read some of his story in some of the books, the publications, but I'm talking to you as the daughter, the one who was there, the one who witnessed everything, at least from the time I arrived. I have been part of this ministry, part of this family, of course. So I'm going to tell the story in my own way, and I believe this is going to be a blessing and an encouragement to you. We begin in Pocasset, Oklahoma, in 1923, actually December of 1923. My father was born the 12th of 13 children to parents who were at that time living on a farm in Oklahoma. My father would say the sticks of Oklahoma. <laughs> and uh, he was the seventh son of a seventh son. I don't know that that's significant, but we always thought it was so interesting. So my father was next to the last. He grew up in a very poor, poor environment. I like to stress that because there are people all over the world that have followed the Osborne ministry. They look to T.L. Osborne as a mentor. And I just love to highlight the fact that you don't have to be rich to have an effective life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. He had no advantage. He was part of that busy, busy farm life. As a matter of fact, by the time he came along, his parents had stopped going to church. They were too busy trying to make a living on the farm. They, they, they just worked. They just worked. Well, it happens that my father... He hated the farm. <laughs> I'm sorry, Osborne family. He really hated the farm. He, he, was a, he was a frail little boy. He was a skinny boy. He had a lisp. He couldn't speak clearly. And so the, the kids at school made fun of him. And yet something happened in his life that changed everything. His conversion is kind of interesting in that one of his older brothers... He had gone to one of this, these camp meetings out in, in the sticks of Oklahoma, and he had given his life to the Lord. Well, this was a brother who had a very, very violent temper, and he had a foul mouth. So it was customary every morning, they're milking the cows. This older brother, if the cow kicked the bucket and knocked over the milk, ooh, would he curse, and he would take a stick and beat that cow? Well, my father was the littler brother, so he was just ducking from these swings and, and terrified when his brother would lose his temper. That was the brother that went to this camp meeting and gave his life to the Lord. His name was Lonnie. Well, Lonnie came back home late that night, and he had been filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was talking in tongues. And his father wouldn't let him in the house because he thought Lonnie had gone crazy. <laughs> now, you're from old-time Pentecost. You understand exactly what this is. Well, the next morning, Lonnie was out milking the cow. My father was out there helping him. And sure enough, old Bessie kicked the bucket and the milk spilled everywhere. But Lonnie reacted differently. My father's ducking, ready for the fury, but all my, my uncle Lonnie did was pat the cow and say, well, hallelujah. 
<laughs> my father was so impacted by the transformation that took place in his brother. He says, I want to go with you to that camp meeting. So Lonnie took him along. My father was 12 years old at that camp meeting. I don't know what the preacher preached. I know it was a woman evangelist. And I know that my father had a radical conversion. He gave his life to the Lord Jesus, and he never, never looked back. From that point, he made a decision to give his life to Jesus and to serve him in every way he could. Now, what does a 12-year-old farm boy with no money do for the Lord? Well, it happened that my father was given, uh, probably as a Christmas gift, he was given a little toy printing press. I'm not sure we even have them today, but it was a little plastic press that had a round cylinder and you could put letters, little rubber letters on it, and you could write things. And then you turn it, put a piece of paper in it, put ink on it, turn it, and you have a little printing press. Well, my father decided he could use that printing press to tell people about Jesus. So he wrote his first salvation tracts. I wish I had a copy of them. I don't. They must have been very short to go around that one little cylinder. But he probably just said, Jesus loves you. He died on the cross for you. You can get saved. I'm sure his message was very simple. But I do know that he used every scrap of paper that he could find, printing these tracks and walking. Forget having a car, never a bicycle. So he would just walk as far as he could, miles and miles in every direction, to every farmhouse, every, every little ranch, everywhere there were people, and he would pass out these tracks. Now, this impresses me today, because knowing the ministry, from, from the very beginning of the ministry, we were printing tracks. My father had written 18, in fact, I have them here to show you, 18 titles of salvation tracks. Very simple, very direct, each one beginning with a story of Jesus. And we have published these tracks in 132 languages and distributed them for many years, over one ton per day in the languages of the world to empower soul winners, to give them tracks to pass out. Now, you see, this teaches us so much. It teaches us that you use what's in your hand. It teaches us that the, your circumstances and the way you're born does not determine your destiny. God saw the heart in that little boy, and he began to use him. My father left the farm when he was 15 years old. That's another story. But when he left the farm, the, the evangelist that took him allowed him uh, to travel, play music as the evangelist was preaching. And at the age of 15, this man told my father, he says, now you're going to preach. You're going to preach on Friday night. Well, my father was terrified. He didn't know how to do that. He had never thought he could speak in public. Remember, he had a speech impediment. He lisped. He, had a, he, had a, he couldn't talk straight. But he decided, well, he said, I guess I'll do it. The preacher says, well, either preach or stand up, turn white, and sit down. <laughs> My father said, I'm going to stand up, and I'm, I might turn white, but I'm not going to sit down. So this was the beginning of my father preaching. Look, look at how God brings people across your path. When you have no advantage, you have no vision, no plan, but when you have a heart toward God, determined to do what He has called you to do, even before you understand the call, look how He brings people across your path. Now, that has been our encouragement to young people all through the 76 years of this ministry. We believe in young people. Young people get God's attention. Well, this is just a little snippet of a story. I hope you enjoy it. Be encouraged by it. And next month, I'll see you again. We'll have another in this series. God bless you.